In case you're not aware, the Quixel ecosystem set of tools is freely available to anyone with an Epic ID. This is especially good news for students and educators looking to integrate new tools into their classroom. If you go to the Quixel YouTube channel, you will find a new playlist called Mixer Fundamentals. This is a great set of videos ranging in length between two minutes and eight minutes. This is a great set of videos that take you through a great many of the tools inside of Mixer, including things like gradient position, curvature, normals, projection modifiers, pattern components, noise components, and many more. This is a great way to learn Mixer and to integrate photorealistic textures into your Unreal Engine projects. You'll be able to utilize the entire Megascans library as well as paint directly on 3D models. If you're looking for amazing new tools to integrate into your curriculum for your next academic term, this would be a great place to start learning Quixel Mixer. Once again, it's free, freely available to all your students, and a great, amazing tool to utilize a massive library of not only textures, but also 3D assets that are photogrammically scanned at the highest level of quality. We've also recently released a beautifully developed PDF called the Creator's Field Guide to Emerging Careers in Interactive 3D. The purpose of this guide is to serve as a field guide to emerging careers and skills in interactive 3D and a roadmap for students, administrators, educators, and job seekers that covers the entry-level Unreal Engine skills needed to join the workforce. It's designed to help people start their journeys with Unreal Engine and interactive 3D. This guide will help advise teachers as where to begin teaching Unreal Engine and which competencies to focus on. It'll help introduce students to emerging careers in interactive 3D and the skills those careers require, arm job seekers with a roadmap to share their knowledge in interviews and as they start their career journey, and also to illustrate to hiring managers what Unreal Engine knowledge new recruits need to have and to prepare administrators to understand the demands and skills across those industries. As you can see, it's a beautifully developed document. And if you want more information about this guide or want to learn where to download it, just go over to unrealengine.com news where you will find a blog that shares all this information as well as the download links where you can get the guide. Hello and welcome to this week's stream. Hello, you know, everybody. Hello. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. You know, I think we're in trouble, guys. We're waiting for this week's guest, and I don't know where the guest is. Oh, wait a minute. It's right there. It's Tom Shannon. He's the guest. Oh, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> Did you know you're going to present today? Uh, well, I'm always ready to present. You just point the camera and say, unreal. Yes. Well, I've got something. Luckily, sure that's the case. No, actually, we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're very well prepared today for Tom to be presenting. Uh, and today's a really exciting stream. Today, we're going to be talking about technical art, which is a very <laughs> exciting topic. And maybe you can see here in the title that Tom is a technical artist. And he's a technical artist in the educational department, which is really exciting because we've been working together. And, uh, you know, we've been having a lot of really amazing streams on Fridays, and we've really been enjoying doing these streams. Uh, you know, last week we had uh, um, the secondary stream, and the week before that, or, you know, uh, a couple of weeks before that, we had Matt Workman in to talk about virtual production. And uh, we've really been sort of excited about getting back also to doing a, you know, more of an in-engine focus stream. Uh, and one of the things that we end up talking a lot about when we travel around or do lectures at schools and, and whatever the case is, is really about technical art. And, and uh, I think that Unreal Engine is an amazing vehicle for technical art. But, mm -hmm. you know, maybe, Tom, can you tell us a little bit about what technical art is and just sort of expand <laughs> on that? Because I think that, you know... I was uh, hoping you could tell me what tech art is for... Is it's it's, it's not it's in my title. It's in because your title. When, when two tech artists meet each other and we say, <laughs> "What do you do?" I'm a tech artist, and oh, you're a tech artist too. Me too. And then we say, "So what do you do?" <laughs> uh, tech art is a really 
kind of it's it's almost at the point where it's like I'm a game developer. It doesn't. It used to be kind of a very specific sort of a role that sat between programmers and artists to help kind of build tools and solve these kind of problems. But as games get more complex, uh, you know, the, the space between artists and programmers grows and grows. And there's all this kind of in between stuff that's not all programming and it's not all art, but it's like kind of got to have an eye for art but the patience and the mind to program and, and the ability to kind of talk computers. And that's where us tech artists sit. And so we're like, uh, there's animatory tech artists, there's pipeline tech artists, there's material and lighting tech artists, uh, audio tech artists, particle tech art and different studios call them different things. I've mm -hmm. worked at a studio where I'm a tech artist and all I did was particle effects. Um, and I'm like, am I the VFX artist? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, but I'm touching, you know, math and materials and lighting and all of that stuff. But it's all kind of particle effects around that. So it's it's really fluid. So I guess my brand of tech art is lighting materials uh, and blueprints and, and building tools. So uh, that's kind of where I started was in solving pipeline problems. I've I've seen people come from both directions. Some people coming from the programming end back into sort of being tech artists, and other people coming from the art end into tech art. And I think both are are really valid ways of doing it. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of us kind of we we're going down one path when we start. And so I went to school to get a degree in art, uh, and along the way, I learned some flash stuff, uh, and that just kind of stuck with me. And I still wanted to do game art. I'm just like, I want to do game art, low poly modeling. It's what I want to do. Um, and then I started working in production and uh, I really disliked a lot of the like tedious stuff that we had to do. And I also, there were things that we were doing that we were like doing guesswork on and, and doing these really kind of difficult kind of ways to figure out how to make this thing go along a spline at a certain speed and, you know, artists had calculators where they were figuring out like, I move it this many frames over this time. And it's, I think it's 70 miles an hour and they didn't, they don't know their math. And so it was always wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, wouldn't it be nice if they could just type in 70 and the thing would go along the spline at 70 miles. An hour. So you that make life be better. Make life that better be, for artists and designers and programmers in many ways. And the product would be better because we the could say be it better. is moving at 70. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and I can prove it, which, which you're doing visualization, Mark. You know this, that yep. there's, there's a lot of questions about, is that really the data I gave you? So before yeah. we get super deep into what's going to be, I think, a really exciting stream this week, um, Let's say hello again to our good friend, Mark hello. Flanagan. Hey, hey there. Mark. So Mark, you know, has, uh, had a very long history in uh, visual effects and film. He came from, uh, you, you've worked at ILM, you've worked at DNEG, yep. you've worked at a variety of different film effects companies. Uh, you've Games taught companies. and trained uh, countless visual effects artists and technical directors and technical artists of various kinds and render man and, you know, many, many different tools before we stole you away to come help us uh, here in the educational world of Unreal Engine. Uh, yep. So it's great to have Mark. Uh, he's been with us, you know, since the beginning of these educational streams. Uh, and it's always great to have his insight as usual. Um, very long history is a very nice way of saying I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, look, I've always had a passion for technical art from the very beginning of being involved in 3D as well. Not to the same extent as Tom, but because I came from <laughs> architecture. And I, I honestly have a strong belief that most art forms have both a technical and an artistic part of them. So architecture mm -hmm. and Tom's come from that background mm -hmm. as well to an extent. But yeah, it. it it is a blend of art and science, and art and science have always been mixed. Like Leonardo da Vinci was a scientist. A technical he was technical <laughs> and he was artistic. Separating the two, to my mind, makes no sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, especially now that yeah. artists are using technical tools 
different. But, you, you know, I think that's a, a, a great point. Like even chiseling out of, I can't just go chisel some marble. Yeah. Uh, I don't have the technical side of it. Even if in my head I can imagine the shape that I want that marble to be, I'm going to have to work on the, the tech side of my art for a while. Um, and that's, that's I think, this is really important because, like you said, you're not, you wouldn't consider yourself a tech artist, but you've done tech art. I yep. consider myself a tech artist because that's really what I enjoy doing. Um, but it's, I think, really, it's key for students and educators to understand right now that that having that technical knowledge, even if you're not a tech artist, is so key. Um, and, and you probably do it kind of naturally. You're learning software, yeah. Um, but that, it, and it's really, I think, the mindset of problem solving and yes, and yeah. wanting to find a better way to do your art. Um, and, and like you said, Mark, some people like me go fully into that and others just have to have that to, to help them with their art so that they don't have to face so many frustrations and can kind of self-service a bit. Yeah. And I, I think one of the big things that's important today is to realize you don't have to be a full on programmer to do these things mm -hmm. and you don't need to be a mathematical genius, just a little bit right. of logic thinking and maybe a little bit of high school maths occasionally, but it's not a it's lot of a will. Lot. Right. You're not a graphics programmer. No. Like, you know, I had to figure out like speed conversions and I, I did have to learn what a tangent and a yeah. binormal are, but you know, that, that was, it took a couple of years, but I finally got it. Uh, <laughs> you know, pay attention to math class kids. Yeah. That's, <laughs> it's they, they say that you're going to use it in the future and they're right. <laughs> uh, and it, I wish I had spent a little more time in, in advanced algebra and geometry, but even though like I didn't, I didn't really go that way in high school and college. And, and I know as much math as I need and, and the stuff that I'm going to show today, I think has almost, I think I'm going to use a multiply node at one point. <laughs> um, and, and so I guess this kind of brings us to what we're yeah just one second uh, yeah. before we get into that stuff uh you know for those of you who don't know me i'm Louis cataldi i've been working with the education team here for a long time at epic i also have a technical background i i came from the film industry i was also a, a technical artist of sorts i was a rigger at blue sky studios and you know also applied it in a very different way you know i, I built characters i assembled characters and made them work for the animation team and that you know has also a lot of math to do so this applies itself in many ways and and one of the things i wanted to bring up which i think is really relevant to the discussion here you know if you are teaching students, if you're preparing curriculum, maybe for the next academic term, or maybe if you're a student, you're not really sure which path to head. You know, as Unreal Engine grows and expands, more and more of these types of disciplines are coming into the engine, right? Like in 4.25, uh, the rigging tools have really evolved quite a bit. And so now more and more people can actually rig inside of Unreal Engine. Uh, now you can do, um, you know, a, a lot more things. You can do a lot more film functions in Unreal Engine. You can do even more complex material work and build your own mm. uh, material types in Unreal Engine, which is a different type of technical art, right? Yep. Um, you can do a variety of different things that escalate your abilities inside of a real-time tool set specifically since we expose all the source code, right? And, and exposing the source code doesn't, you know, and Tom, I think you'll be able to speak much more to this, doesn't mean that you have to dig in and become a C++ programmer. What it means is that you can find out where the engine is open and that you can go in and say, well, oh, I see what it's doing here. Let me see how to leverage that. Because I think that that's where many tech artists are able to go in and see what the engine is doing. And by mm -hmm. seeing what the engine is doing, they can see what, what they want to do with it, right? And I think that's one of the greatest yeah. abilities of a, a tech artist, and you guys mentioned it already, is a problem solver. And so mm -hmm. if you're an educator on the stream, if you make YouTube videos, if you're a student, what we need more of, you know, and, and Mark and Tom and I, you know, have the, the benefit of, of sort of being around uh, the people that come to Epic all the time saying we need more of X, right? And what many people need more of constantly is problem solvers in real time, problem solvers in the engine. 
And a lot of those add up to be some type of a technical artist, technical designer, technical X, right? And that means somebody mm-hmm. that can solve problems in the engine, make it run it, whether it's 24 frames a second, whether it's 60 frames a second, whether it's 120 frames a second, whether it's 240 frames a second, right? And so a lot of that really adds up to what is the engine doing? How do I make it do what I need it to do at this frame rate? And how do I make the client happy at the frame rate they need, right? And, uh, and by the time you've done that a couple of times, bingo bongo, you're a tech artist in many ways. Right? <laughs> Am I right? You know, Right. And it depends on the studio you're at, whether you're going to get called a tech artist or you're going to get called a rigger or a tools programmer or, or whatever. And it is there's a lot of questions in the chat here about, like, so how do we get started as a tech artist? How do we help kids become tech artists? And Mark posted a link to a blog that we wrote uh, about being a tech artist. Um, so it kind of it'll help dig into that term a little more for you. Um, but I think some of the comments in there were, were really right on is mm. um, finding those students that are already kind of filling in that gap. Uh, you know, you'll have your students that are excellent artists, and it's very clear, and your students programmers. There's going to be these students that kind of uh, Make find it work, their right? way somewhere in between, and they, they want to solve problems, and they might be the ones that are working on lots of teams and kind of identifying where things aren't working and sort of setting up her force or doing these things that are related to game development, but aren't exactly art or aren't exactly programming, mm-hmm. aren't exactly design. They're that, that glue that kind of sticks them all together. And that's why tech artists are in such crazy high demand, even if they're not posting job postings for tech artists. Yep. If you go in and you're a, a character artist who can do materials and lighting as well uh, as excellent characters, you're going to get the job over at the other 22 people who do excellent characters because it's a little more obvious to be able to do that one thing. So it's that it helps you become that unicorn. Yeah. Don't it's you funny. Be a unicorn? People in the chat, you. people in the chat said, Oh, apparently I've been one for years. And, and that <laughs> happens a lot too. It's like, I didn't really know I was a tech artist, but I've been solving problems at my studio or my, you know, advertising company or my architecture firm for years in unreal engine or whatever. And, uh, and yeah, you, yeah. I didn't know I was a tech artist until I went to GDC <laughs> Uh, and I met this guy and he was like, oh, I think you should come to this tech artist round table. And I was like, what is a tech artist round table? Uh, and so I sat in this room and there was like 20 of us tech artists from wherever. And we, no one, that term didn't exist yet. Uh, and so we were all talking about like, what are we? And, and most of the conversation was about how do we sneak in tech art in the production budget? <laughs> Because we weren't supposed to be programming or building tools. I was supposed to be, you know, building cars and materialing them and instead of writing a tool that'll do it for me. Um, and so we'd have to kind of break it to our leads. <laughs> we'd have to, you know, hey, ah, uh, you know, all those hours I spent, well, I didn't do that thing, but I did this. Do you remember that comedian <laughs> a while back who was like, you might be a redneck if... <laughs> right yeah you i think we missed an opportunity artist, to yeah. do that with tech art <laughs> there, there, there is another role as artist. well which some people um may actually find relevant to themselves in the film industry quite often you hear the term at uh, td technical mm, director yes which yep. is very very close to what a tech artist is in the games industry first cousin absolutely and you know cousin. and that's that's absolutely kind of the the career path so i think most people when they start out typically i don't know that there's a lot of opening tech artist positions um but i could be wrong it's been a while since i've started and i kind of grew into the position yeah um, but it's kind of a position you tend to kind of grow into yeah um, and that's something I would love to, you know, if schools can and students can identify earlier that that's what they want to do and schools can offer that, that'd be great. Uh, but I, I do really believe it's kind of a discovered thing that, yeah. that you kind I, of figure out as you figure out what kind of artist you are. Is, um, definitely, you know, it's very it, much 
it's the, the thing person, that gives you that joy. And if the person that, sitting there doing the thing, you know, I'm, I'm having trouble rigging this thing, and I made something to make it easier, and then I share it with everybody else in the company, and suddenly I'm a tech artist. Well, I think that it <laughs> happens that way, right? And I think that yeah. you, you'll find these people that are resistant at first, and they're like, "I'm just an artist, or I'm just a designer, and I just want to go in there and make my thing pretty, or make my thing, you know, prototype my thing." But then they find their gateways. And I think it's this is a good way to transition into some of the gateways, right? They may go, well, I'd like to be able to either build the material to make this thing look great, or I'd like to write the blueprint to make this thing do something, or I'd like to, you know, build the particle systems or build the rig. And so there are a series of gateways that help really expose people to the, the technical aspect of the art, right? And so, mm. you know, it's, you know, it could be that you start to really embrace the material system in Unreal Engine, and that really opens up your world. And you're like, wow, I can do this, and I can do that, and I can do the other thing. And I was just doing this brute force the hard way, and then I discovered the material system is super flexible, and I don't have to do it the hard way. I can do it once and propagate it to, a, you know, a thousand objects or or you discover blueprints, right? And blueprints just mm -hmm. really opens up your world, which is going to be the focus of, you know, the rest of today's stream, or you discover the effect system, or you discover the terrain system, or you discover mm -hmm. all these other systems in the engine that take someone who right. says, you know, I've labeled myself just an artist or just a designer. And before you know it, they're like, well, I could do this, you know, for the next two weeks, one at a time, or I could do it once for the next day or two and then push a button and it's done. And I'm just going to go mm -hmm. play, you know, ping pong for the next three days. Yep. Right. There's one of the things which I, I remember one of my favorite tech artists said that it may take me three days to make this tool, to do a thing that might take you 20 minutes to do once, but then I can use it for the rest of this week and get five months worth of work done. So and it, that was that was literally the only way I got to keep doing tech yeah. art was by showing that when I do this, we can save this amount in the future. Um, and it, but it was still kind of like, but it says on your business card, three D artist. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you need a copy of Visual Studio? This this doesn't work. Um, and uh, Lewis brought up something that that's also a, a big part of the role of tech artist is understanding the technology that you're mm. using. And oftentimes, helping the rest of the team understand the technology better. One of my favorite jobs as a tech artist was getting new software. And it was kind of my job to poke every button in it and put our data into it and throw it in our pipeline and try and see where it breaks, see where it works, see where it doesn't, and then go to the rest of the team and, and just give them an idea of like, push this button when this happens, never touch these things over here and give them guidance. So we didn't have, you know, 20 artists all having to hit every button to figure out what the right way was and coming up with their own way. It was my responsibility to figure that out and then get everyone together in a room and be like, this is how we're going to do it. Now you don't have to go through all of that because, and a lot of artists don't, they don't want to. Some people, they don't want to click every button. I'm like, I don't understand that. Just, mm -hmm. I love Unreal. It has so many buttons to click. <laughs> 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 I want to see what each one does. Uh, so, you know, it's not always about like programming or like mastering materials or HLSL or it's, it's very broad. And it's, it, you know, again, that's like filling in that gap, like, oh, the artists haven't really figured out this technical tool. I can do it and just tell them how to do it. Mm -hmm. That's, that's it, it, so this is all, you know, these are things that aren't like out of the book of game dev of what you're going right. to be doing. Um, they're kind of things that you discover and, and each studio and each production within a studio will be very different. You know, like I said, sometimes I was being very technical I was, I was just making particle systems for six months. Um, it's a, it's a very fluid and it's one of the reasons I really enjoy being a tech artist is that it is so fluid. Um, and I get to solve lots of different problems and work you know, one week with audio folks and one week with the programmers over here. I'm in, oh, I'm doing physics now. Um, so, you know, with my ADD, it helps a little bit that I, I don't get bored with the thing I'm working on. Um, I can, I can help everyone. So it's, it's really a great position. It's so much fun. Well, one of the things that's obviously. really, obviously, <laughs> really awesome is that, you know, Tom and I, uh, you know, when we were sitting uh, at Epic, you know, working every day, we sat next to each other and, you know, I would, we would build sample projects and we would 
build learning material all the time, you know, and I would, I'd be really proud of myself because I'd build this really cool demo thing or whatever sample project that we'd be working on. And I'd, I'd have, you know, the blueprint editor open and I'd be working on this really cool blueprint thing that was going to do whatever. And I was really proud of myself for getting it to work until I'd run across something. And I was like, you know, Hey Tom, you know, cause you know, he, he he's really good at, at uh, tech art and blueprint and, and, uh, he was always such a really good resource for helping me to understand and, and improving my skills of Blueprint. And then I'd look over at his screen and his Blueprint was five times the size of mine or whatever, you know, <laughs> was doing 10 times more, you know. Um, and, and so he would humble me, you know, very quickly uh, because, you know, he's very skilled uh, with these <laughs> things. And so, um, you know, today we're going to be focusing, I think, more on this particular aspect, because, you know, I'm not a programmer per se, and I don't think you have a traditional background in programming, but Blueprint in particular inside of Unreal Engine is extremely liberating, you know, and I, and I mm -hmm. did a lot of Mel scripting and some Python scripting when I was rigging as well. And, and, you know, the ability to automate tasks with these tools are, are super critical. And inside of Unreal Engine, you know, Blueprint is threaded throughout the entire engine and it's super powerful and it's a, a very liberating to an artist or a designer who wants to do things. You know, why don't you share a little bit more of your depth and insight, Tom, because you, you're much more of a master than I am with Blueprint. And today you're going to be talking much more in depth about Blueprint. Yeah. So, um, I'll, so what we're going to be covering today is, is that, that kind of tool side of uh, tech art. Um, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna be taking a look at blueprints, and there's a, a thing that tech artists do um, is build new tools and build new workflows or improve workflows. And um, so blueprints has some some functionality that's been added in the later versions of Unreal now that really allow you to do um, scripting in the engine to do stuff. In, in a kind of pipeline format. And I'm really used to doing this. Like I did this with, like you said, Mel scripting and Max scripting and Python and um, just kind of automating things that we've got to do all the time or um, making sure that everyone on the team just has a button that they can push and it does it the right way. So, you know, make sure everyone's naming everything right. Well, what if we just make a button that, you know, names it for them and now oh. everyone will do it the right <laughs> way. Um, so sometimes the tools are just about removing error or, you know, the artists refuse to name it the right way because, you know, it's some weird code and they, their art brains hate that. So oh, we'll just give them a button and now they'll do it. Um, so we're going to look at um, a couple of things here. So there's a bunch of ways in Unreal for us to um, make things happen in the editor. Uh, before we press play. So typically when we're talking to Unreal um, and programming, we're talking gameplay programming. So it's the stuff you do when you press play, stuff happens, and that's not my kind of programming. I can do that programming. I've learned it, but um, that's what, what what I would call gameplay programming. And in Unreal, that's in Blueprints or C++. Um, and just so folks know, um, if you're new to Unreal in the stream, Blueprints are a programming language that were created by Epic Games for Unreal Engine. So it lives totally in the editor. Uh, you can't edit them outside, and there's no other application that uses Blueprints. It's just for Unreal. C++ is a programming language that's much more famous. It's a general purpose programming language that tons and tons of applications are built on. It's it's really very high-end um, kind of complex stuff. And uh, I'm so glad that there's blueprints because I don't want to have to do C++ too much. <laughs> I'll do it when I have to, but it's it's not my happy place. So, um, so yeah, blueprints are a visual scripting language built in. So uh, with blueprints, there's no code. Well, there's code, but there's no syntax. Um, so 
you don't have to worry about mistyping things or colons missing or things formatted wrong. It's, it's all graphical. And if you connect the wire, it happens. Um, so it, it removes a lot of that, that complexity. And, um, you know, that's, that's the art side of me. It's like, I don't want to have to deal with all that, a header file and all of that stuff. I want it quick. I want that instant gratification. Uh, but I still want to be able to do some code. So Blueprint compiles instantly in the editor. There's no compiling times. There's no wait times. You don't even actually have to hit compile. Sometimes you can just hit the play button. It compiles all of them and your game starts. So they give you this instant satisfaction. And um, so that's gameplay programming. That's So we use C++ and Blueprints and Unreal Engine. And as far as gameplay programming goes, they're essentially the same. You can do a little more with C++ and they're faster, but you can do so much with Blueprints. Like, I don't know, 80, 90% of this stuff is exposed in Blueprints. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so... That's that's like gameplay programming. We talk about it a lot. When you type in programming in Unreal Engine, it'll talk about gameplay programming. That's you know making triggers do stuff, collecting coins, jumping, and all that stuff. So what in editor programming is, or in editor scripting, is building tools and stuff that run before you press play. So it's stuff that'll act on stuff that's in your content browser. So I want to do rename stuff in my content browser, or move things in the content or organize things, uh, you know, change properties, or I want to select a bunch of things that are in my level and do things to those before I press play. So there are tools that help level designers and artists build games. Um, and so there's a, there's a bunch of different ways to do this uh, in Unreal. Um, we've exposed a ton of this functionality. Uh, so we've exposed it, I guess there's, previously we had some stuff that you could do called commandlets, uh, and nobody knows how to do that except for three guys locked in the basement at Epic. Uh, <laughs> we have to keep them there so they can make us more commandlets. And they're, they're C++ applications that like tie into the engine and you have to like compile them out. So they're not for like, they're not for me, that's for sure. Uh, and then there's some, you could do some some batch scripting and some Python stuff, but all of this stuff had kind of a, a problem that it ran kind of outside the editor on content and then you'd bring, open up the editor and work. Um, and so we didn't really have a way of doing stuff in the editor. So we've added some functionality to Blueprints. We took Blueprints, we opened them up. And the first thing we did was we created utility blueprints, or we used to call them blue utilities. Um, now they're utility blueprints. And they're blueprints where we can make code that does stuff in the editor. Um, and they're they're pretty cool. And you'll see they show up in your right-click menu and they're there. And um, and that was that was great. And you could do tons of stuff with it. But there was a limitation there uh, that you couldn't do a lot of options. You know, you can only do so much with a right click. Um, so what we did was we took those utilities and all the stuff that they could do, and we combined them with UMG. So instead of making a blueprint, you make a UMG widget that has all of that editor scripting ability. And we, we've allowed that UMG to run in the editor. So when you run it, rather than making a UI for your, your game, you make a little panel in Unreal. Um, so now you can actually make panels and tools in Unreal with UMG and Blueprints. Um, so all those panels and stuff that you can dock, you can make your own now. Uh, and you can do it all with Blueprints. Um, and it's really amazing. So you can build different types of tools. So we're going to kind of walk through that process and, and uh, kind of look at the differences between those. So any other questions before I dive in? There were a couple of questions that popped through. Let's see. Let's see. There was a... There's so many. They're moving so fast. They're going really fast here, yes. Some of them have been answered. 
Can I make t-shirts? Yep. Make t-shirts. Uh, UMG thing, can it be used by the player? That's a great question. So this is, these tools that we're going to be looking at are totally in editor. Um, so they are not for the player at all. They are for the people making the game. Um, and in these UMG interfaces, as you'll see, they wouldn't be exposed. Because uh, you probably wouldn't want, your, well, it depends on the game. Probably wouldn't want your player deleting assets or stuff like that, maybe. Question here about depends um, on the game. <laughs> scattering foliage. I think that's something which yeah. we have built in tools, but you can certainly expand on them in blueprints. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I've built uh, scattering tools in blueprints myself because sometimes what we've built isn't exactly what we needed. Yep. You know, I needed something that like put a specific tree with a specific kind of foliage that fell from it. And, um, an ecosystem. You know, I, 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 yeah, it was an ecosystem thing and I built it in blueprint and it was just a bunch of ray casts and choosing mm -hmm. things and adding them to instant static mesh things. So we do have lots of tools uh, that are built in to do it. There's the foliage material system that'll like automatically put foliage wherever a certain material is. There's the, the what it, the, uh, the ecosystem tool. It's yeah. experimental. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, very powerful. That we use, it's really powerful. Paulo um, did a really did. nice video about it a couple of weeks ago. Paulo yeah. Sosa, the evangelist from Brazil. Shout out, Paulo. Nice job. <laughs> uh, hey. uh, so yeah, so there's lots of ways to scatter foliage, and and a blueprint in editor tool would be a great way of doing it. There was a good so question cool. that popped oh. through about um, Python and the difference between Python and Blueprint. And this is, I think, a really important question because you mm. know, uh, you know, Blueprint has its very special place in the engine, and Python has its very special place in the engine. Would you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. So. What we're going to be looking at today, actually, is where Python lives in the engine. So um, when you hear that Unreal Engine has Python in it, unfortunately, it doesn't mean that it's got a text-based programming language built into the editor, like C Sharp or whatever. Our Python is entirely in editor tools. So um, Python is a, a text-based programming language, um, and it's hugely popular um, in production. Uh, movie production, game production. Um, and it's because it can build, um, you can really easily build cross-platform tools with it. So you can make a, a Python script, you hit compile, and it'll run on anything, Mac, Linux, whatever, with a nice interface. Um, and it And a lot of applications have added Python support. So Max, Maya, everything's got Python support now. So uh, it's it's the programming language of choice for when companies and studios are building pipelines because it integrates with everything and it integrates with Unreal now. And so almost everything, and maybe a little more even, that I'm going to show today, you can do in Python as well. So if you're already really great with Python or your studio has someone who's great with Python, these are the sorts of things you can do with Python as well, and you can build these tools. And the cool thing about Python is you could build a tool that runs outside the editor, that kicks open the editor, runs all this stuff, and edits the editor. Um, so that's something you can't do with Blueprint. So Python is maybe a, another step up, or you know, if you already know it, just use that. So what we've done is for Python, just kind of all the blueprint nodes we provided as functions for, for Python. So in Python, you can just do all the exact same thing. Let me ask you a question before we get into uh, it a little deeper into the actual um, editor work. Uh, if I'm an instructor, if I'm a teacher, you know, this is an educator stream and I'm teaching art or I'm teaching game development or I'm teaching film, you know, I'm not teaching programming per se. Do I need to focus on this stuff? Should I, you know, where do I send my students? Should I find a way to teach these kind of tools in my art class? Should I find a way to teach these schools in my, you know, these tools in my filmmaking class or in my VR class or something like that? You know, is this something I need to send them out to a programming instructor to to learn, or, you know, um, why teach them this in an mm. art class, or why teach them this in a design class, or in a filmmaking class, or a VR class? That's a that's a great question, and it's 
I think it's a pretty philosophical one. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's why I don't see a lot of tech art programs because you may have a cohort that year and not one of your students really has that mm -hmm. bent. Um, and if you've got a cohort of really talented art students, maybe it's not worth spending that time to teach the, the deeper tools. Um, however, I think at least making sure that when you do have those technically minded students, that uh, you have some plans for them uh, mm -hmm. so that they have something a little extra for them to do to use that, utilize that technical kind of bent that they have. Um, I think that, that, you know, working, working some tech art into an art program, especially a game art program or a film art these days is probably essential. Um, whether you have to specifically teach a programming language like Python, I wouldn't do that. That's a, that's a lot. And that's one thing that maybe blueprints are really nice at is um, you'll see that some of the tools that I make here are, are going to be really simple um, and, and really don't lean on a lot of like heavy programming concepts. You know, like we're going to look at some loops and some really basic stuff. Um, so, you know, and it's nice because they don't have to learn syntax. They just have to learn a bit of the logic. Um, and I think it's essential for everyone on the team um, building interactive applications that they have an understanding of the application. So even if they can't really build the tool or there's someone better on the team that uh, for building the tool, uh, they can speak the language and they can understand what can be done and what can't. You know, if you don't know what you don't know, you won't even know to go to the tool guy on the team. But if you know, oh, that I bet tools can do that, uh, then you can lean on those folks and, and make sure that they're they're building a cool reusable tool. There's nothing worse as a tech artist than like finding out that you know that one team over on the other side of the building has been doing it their way. <laughs> with their like weird setup and you're like, oh no. But oh well, you didn't know it's so easy over everywhere else. Um and your stuff doesn't quite match. So well and then uh, you know we we travel around and visit lots of schools. And so you know it was kind of a setup question because what we discover is that uh the teams that you don't have to teach programming but exposing the students, you know, we we find lots and lots of art programs where the students will find this stuff on their own and they become that much more effective in their capstone projects and whatever they do become that much better because somebody on the team, you know, it's an amazing girl or it's some amazing guy just says, this is the way, you know, this is mm -hmm. the path. And they just blossom and their projects blossom because they yeah. go that much further. And, uh, another thing I wanted to point out is that not every instructor out there has to become a blueprint expert in order to expose their students to this content. We have material on our online learning platform, you know, on learn.unrealengine.com. And if you go to our learning section for instructors, there's a whole course that you can go and, and download. Uh, and there's teaching material for teaching blueprint and teaching base fundamentals of programming. Cause I think a lot of what you're going to show and a lot of what you end up doing is just some basic fundamental, you know, Boolean statements and, and, you know, loops and uh, basic logic and, and programming in blueprint is not, you know, crazy heavy memory management. And um, no, yeah. it's, it's almost pure logic. It's which just is, logic. It's just uh, logic. You know, for learning programming concepts, it's great because it gets rid of a lot of that, that overhead. Yeah, it's uh, so it's, it's why I, I prefer should, to use blueprints over text. Just expose um, so, them, you know, just do it, right? Like, go for it. Yeah, and, and I think that's it, is uh, make sure that when you have those, you know, have it in mind and, and have something available for those students and identify them and help them identify themselves uh, yeah. so that they can know, hey, you might be a tech artist. You might want to go down this path, and here's what you can do. Yeah, we that. need them, right, Mark? <laughs> We Absolutely. need them. One of the things as well, um, I think for any tech artist, is don't expect that you're going to know everything straight off. You need to actually know how to use the documents and search for the things you're looking for. 
because most people Good I know point. don't know exactly the name of every blueprint node they're going to use. Um, but they need to know how to use the documentation to find it. That's really a critical part for any tech artists. Um, and Matthew Wadstein's is... website. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that helps. There's a guy by the name of Matthew Wadstein who has a YouTube channel, and he is systematically going through, like, Blueprint. All and, the Blueprint nodes. And he's but going node by node and, baking, you know, doing a little base project with that node and explaining what it does. That's one great resource. God and another great resource <laughs> is uh, a website by our Brazilian friend, Marcus Romero, Romero Blueprints. And there's uh, three compendiums that Marcus Romero has built. And they're absolutely amazing because once again, they give you contextual examples of how to use many of the Blueprint nodes uh, and how they can be you know, paired together to, to assemble functionality, you know, once again, without having to write a single line of code. So those are, you know, if I had to give two resources for just getting up to speed and sending your students down yeah. the right path, uh, Romero Blueprints and Matthew Wadstein's content on his YouTube channel. Shall I uh, build some Good. tools? To that, people? that would be lovely. Build something. All right. I am sharing a screen here. Are we all seeing an editor shaking about? We Jiggle are. Jiggle. Excellent, excellent. All right. So, um, so uh, let's see. Where should I start here? All right. So let, I'm going to talk. We're talking in editor tools. Um, so I'm going to start with maybe an in editor tool. If you've been using Unreal, you've maybe used one of these or built one yourself. And it's called a construction script. Um, and so this is kind of, um, let's see, content browser, here we go. A construction script is uh, a part of any actor blueprint. Go. And I'm not gonna build a construction script in this one because that's not what I'm focusing on. Um, but the construction script is a, a function in every actor blueprint that we have that can run in the editor. Um, so when you place an actor into the editor, this construction script runs and it can run this logic and do stuff in the editor before you hit play. Uh, and this is really cool because it lets you build kind of procedural actors that you can plop in. So in this case, uh, it's a really simple uh, blueprint. And all it does is it takes a for loop and it loops through it and it places a mesh in a line. Um, and so the way it does this is that we uh, expose some parameters. So we create variables here. And then if you click on this little I, what it does is it tells Unreal the the user is going to want to change this. Uh, we're going to expose this to the editor. And so uh, I'm not going to dig into this right now, but I'll show you how it works. So uh, as I place this in the level, I can define a static mesh here. Let's do like a column. There we go. Bigger than I thought. And then what I can do is I can say, um, how far do I want them to be spaced? I'm going to have them at like 100 units. And then how many do I want? Well, I want five of them. And it's not going to work. <laughs> All right, I'm going to try a different one. Apparently, I found the broken, uh, the broken one. Perfect. Let me do a different one that's a little more complicated, but I know it works. This one, instead of just placing it along a line, this uh, this uh, actor has a spline built in. So it's got this spline component, and what I can do is I'm try and select on this. Courtesy. We can define a path. I'll add a couple points to it. Come around. And what we can do is here are the variables that I've exposed. So as I built this, I've, I've exposed these so that they can be changed. So I want a different mesh. Let's do our column again. You can see. What it's done is it's taken that column and it's placed it 
along that mesh in an array. And um, I can change the spacing. Yeah. Um, I can randomize it so that it's got different directions. And at any point, I can you know just modify the spline and it changes the array. This is a super cool tool that was built in Unreal and it's intended to run in the game. And then when we press play, um, you know, our columns are just there uh, as if they were always there. Um, so this is the kind of tool that it, it's really cool. It's a construction script tool and it's great for building kind of procedural actors and stuff. So as you're placing them, they do these logical things so you don't have to go place all these uh, in a spline. So this is a, a form of in-editor tool. Um, and this is great for level building and stuff, but what if you already have a level with a bunch of stuff that you want to do a bunch of stuff to? What if you already have a content browser full of stuff that you want to do stuff to? The construction script can't do anything to the stuff in the content browser. When you run the construction script, it only does it on this one, this one actor right here. So I, if I had another actor, only this one actor's construction script is running as I modify this. So I can only do one thing at a time. I can't go and chain, wholesale change a bunch of things. And that's one of the reasons for in-editor scripting is oftentimes we have a level and we need to rotate all of the whatever mesh 90 degrees to the left, but only if it's red. Um, so, you know, typically that would be an intern going and rotating all of them. Um, and making a bunch of errors. Um, so instead, we're like, let's let's make let's make a tool that does that. So um, construction scripts are built in. Every actor has them. You don't have to do anything when you create an actor. There's a little tab for construction scripts. To create what we're going to be making here, uh, you do have to enable a plugin. Um, so we're going to go to Edit and Plugins. Now, for those that are new to Unreal, when I'm talking plugins like these, these are built into the engine. They're more like modules. Um, so they're not like a third-party plugin that I've gone and found somewhere and added. All of this stuff shipped with it. You can see it's called built-in. So if I do add a third-party plugin, it'll show up in another section here called third-party. Um, so all of these built-in plugins already ship with the engine. We just don't have them all turned on because not everyone needs, you know, the adjust analytics provider. Uh, and that would take up more memory and make things load longer. So what we've done is we've selected um, what we think are the, the, what we know are the most common plugins and features that people use. Um, and so anything that's outside of that, you'll have to enable. And in, in editor scripting is one of those things. Um, so I'm just going to come on down here to scripting. And you'll see we have some things that we can do in scripting. And this is what we need to enable up here. And I've already enabled it. Helper functions to script your own UE4 editor functionalities within Blueprint or other scripting tools. So these editor scripting utilities are the functions that are used by both Blueprint, Python, and any other tool that you want to use. So you've got to enable that. Um, there are some other scripting things that you can add. Uh, you can add some the movie render pipeline scripting and the sequencer scripting. So if you're doing movie rendering, you can create tools that automatically, say, open up sequences and render them out or, or do whatever that you need to do with your sequences. But again, we'll only turn those on if if we need that. Uh, if you're using Python, of course, you just turn on the Python plugin here. You click Restart, and you get this stuff. So with that set up, I'm going to open up a level here. Don't save that. Go. Come on over here. So this, this level is a, a level that you can get from the marketplace with a couple of changes and stuff. We've been using it to teach some stuff. Um, and it's mobile optimized. Uh, so it's actually already pretty performant. But there's something wrong with this level uh, that me as a tech artist, I just, I can't, I can't let it slide. Because one of my jobs as a tech artist is to make sure that our projects run at frame rate. 
so one of my jobs, my type of tech artist, I do a lot of optimization because I understand the technology, how the engine is rendering, and I understand how materials are made and how to, to make them faster. It kind of falls on my shoulder a lot of times to help with optimization and help make sure we hit performance targets. Um, and so what all these meshes are missing, I already know this, is none of them have LOD or level of detail meshes built in. So for those that don't know, an LOD or LOD mesh, level of detail mesh, is a, a, a reduced complexity or reduced resolution version of a mesh that we can switch to automatically as that mesh gets smaller on screen. Because as it gets smaller on screen, um, let's take, for example, this uh, statue here. Right now, you can see it's got you know these vertices here and on its face. And we need all those vertices so that it has a nice silhouette and all the detail that we want. But if I come way out here, I don't need all of those vertices anymore to show me the nose and the eyes and the lips. They're all one pixel from this far out. So a long time ago, some smart guy was like, you know, if we can switch to a lower res version as we get further away from these things, we can have more stuff because now we'll be rendering fewer triangles. And so level of detail has been in games since some of the very first 3D games as a way of letting us have a lot more stuff in our level because the stuff in the distance is becoming less and less complex. And so right now in this level, I know already none of these meshes have LOD. And I can actually test that. As a tech artist, when I got a scene that was not running great, the very first thing, one of the first things I do, the very first thing I do actually is I would turn on the frame rate counter. I already know we're at 60 frames a second because I'm running a mobile game on a 2070 or something like that. So it's going to run OK. Um, the next thing I'll do is I'm going to check what's going on in the scene. And one of the first things I do is I come down here in the lit menu level of detail coloration, and I'll click on mesh LOD coloration. And everything turns black, and then it comes back. So it's it's compiling some shaders. Unreal does love to compile shaders. And what we're looking at is a visualization that helps me understand if there are LODs. And I can tell, because I've used this tool before, there's no LODs. Because when there's LODs, the meshes will change color from this white color to different colors. Uh, and, and we'll see how that shows us the LOD, but it's not exactly the purpose of the talk. So I'm like, oh, I can't believe they built this entire level and they didn't make a single LOD. Probably unlikely, but I've seen stranger things. So this team built this beautiful level and they didn't have any LODs. And so on mobile, this thing is chugging along. Well, you know, to fortunately, Unreal has a built-in LOD system, so they don't have to go back to Max and Maya and build a million LODs and re-import them. <sighs> Thank goodness for that. But still, someone at this point would have to go through each and every one of these, open up the editor. Um, uh, oh, that's even a blueprint. Oh, that won't, that won't work. They'll have to come in here, open up the editor, Find the LOD, type in LOD group, and set it to the group that they want. Click yes, and do that for every single one. And you can see now that I've added LODs to this this mesh here, it changes color. So uh, red means LOD one or the next step down, and then it'll go green and blue. Um, and so you can see now, as we get further away from these objects, they're going to use much less memory and resources to render. And wouldn't it be great if everything in the level did this? So no one wants to go through this, because uh, if we come here and look at how many we have, uh, there's a, just in this scene, there are 113 different meshes. So you can imagine, you know, it would take a couple of hours to do that, uh, which isn't bad. But you're going to do it a lot. And you want to make sure that when this team comes back with no LODs, I can have to do this again. Or if whatever, we just want to, I want to be able to add LODs to all of these objects, all of these meshes all at once. And that is 
what in editor scripting is all about. So there's a problem. No one wants to do this. I don't want to sit there and hit that a million times. And boy, I bet the level of error is super high on that because that intern might click the wrong group. They might miss half the meshes. They didn't click apply, whatever it is. Someone does something that boring and tedious for hours on end with that many clicks, they're going to start making mistakes. And then someone has to redo it. That is where I start to like go into tech art overdrive when I hear someone has to redo a thing. I'm like, make it a button. So let's make this a button. Let's make a button basically that'll go and add LODs to all these meshes. I'm going to go back to my content folder, get rid of static mesh, and I will make a new folder for organization. We'll call this my tools, whatever. And now I'm going to create one. So typically when you create a blueprint, you right click and you create blueprint and you choose a class up here. Well, for these blueprints, they're a little, little fancy. So you'll see now that we enabled editor utilities. We can choose between two, an editor utility blueprint and an editor utility. Like I said, uh, the widget is like the advanced version where we can create an interface, and we'll get there. For now, we're going to look at these editor utility. So I'll make one. And just like a regular blueprint, it's like, so what kind of utility blueprint? And uh, so you can see there are actually a bunch of kind of utility blueprints that you can use. Um, but the main ones that you want to focus on typically um, are actor action utilities and asset action utilities. Now, if you don't know your Unreal terminology, you go, that's the diff. So anytime I teach Unreal, I hammer these two terms home because if you know the difference, things become so much clearer. When you're using Unreal and someone says an actor, an actor is one of the things that's in the level that you can click on. So Anything that's in a level is an actor. Anything that's an asset lives in the content browser over here. So an asset lives in the content browser. It's stored on disk. And then that asset gets instantiated into lots of different levels, or a lot of times in a single level, as actors. So multiple actors and reference a single asset. Um, so when you're here and you're like, ooh, what, which one do I want? Just think, do I want to work on this stuff in the content browser or do I want to right click on stuff in the, in the viewport? And I want to right click on stuff in the content browser because I want to change the LODs and that's where you do that. So I'm going to choose an asset action utility. Let's call this BPU uh, for blueprint utility. Uh, set LODs. We'll pop that open. And we can click that. And I'm just going to dock this here for maximum screen. So here's the editor. And you can see it's like the Blueprint editor if you're used to that, except it doesn't have a construction script and it doesn't have a viewport. It only has this event graph. And so what we do is really simple. You create a new function. So we create a new function and we give it a name. Let's call this one set LODs. Why not? And I'm just going to, for now, just do a uh, print screen so that we can see that this is working. So I'm going to compile and save. And then I have to do one thing before I can use this. I right click on it and I run it. So running actually evaluates it and it loads it up into memory and now it's ready to use. And so now if I right click on any asset in the content browser, there's a new menu here. Let's set LOD. So I've now just made a new menu in Unreal Engine. Me. I changed my engine that I use every day, which I think is really cool. You know, the ability to, to make this huge engine kind of your own is really cool. And when I click set LODs, it didn't. Why didn't it do? Did it just not show up? It could be this view mode doesn't allow developer tools. There it is. It did say it. I'm guessing this view mode just doesn't show uh, screen messages. Or something's going on. But you can see it here. Whatever, Whatever's going on, Blueprint. It's because I'm live. 
you know, an hour ago when I did this. Fine. Now I'm live. Yeah. So I'm I'm reasonably happy that it's working. So now I can start to do stuff. So we have a bunch of functions that we can use now. So when this calls, uh, there's a function that you're going to use a lot for when you do this, and it's called get selected assets. So I can just say get selected assets, and now I'll get a ret an array or a list of all of the assets that are selected in the content browser. And so uh, now I can work on those. So I get a list and I'm gonna do a for each. For every one of those, I'm gonna do stuff. And I wanna set the LODs. So if I tried to do that straight out of here and I typed in LOD, I'm not gonna really get anything because I'm trying to do this to an object. And an object is like the top class. Everything comes from that. Objects really are just, they don't, they don't know how to do anything. Um, so I need the type of actor, the type of class that can set LODs. And that's a static mesh. Like I can't set LODs on an audio queue or on a, on a blueprint. That doesn't really make sense. But on a static mesh, they need LODs. So I need to say, hey, Unreal, I'm going to be working on a static mesh. And we do that through casting. Uh, cast to static mesh. And casting is how, in programming, if you're from C, this makes total sense to you. Blueprints is very much like C. Blueprints and C are made, C++ are made to work together. So blueprints do things like C do. Um, and one of those things that C do is casting. And it's a way of, so rather than listing all the functions that all the different classes can do, uh, we can kind of organize them. And we do that by, by casting essentially. And so what we're saying here is, I just, I wanna access the static mesh stuff, stuff I can do to a static mesh. So I'm gonna say for each object that I click on, try and turn it into a static mesh or see if it's a static mesh. And if it is, this top one will fire. If it's not, nothing will happen or we can make stuff happen with the cast failed. So now when I drag out here, I get all the stuff that I can do to a static mesh. And one of those is set LODs. So you can see that's under the editor scripting there, set LODs. Real quick, if I come down, open that up and I go to editor scripting, Here's all the stuff we can do with editor scripting the static meshes. So it's really a good idea often to see this, dig in and just look and see what can we do? Because then you'll have an idea of what's available to me. What can I build in these tools and what can't I? Um, so, you know, and there's a ton of stuff here. I can insert UV channels. I can get the LOD count so I can see if they already have LOD, whatever. I can remove the LOD or uh, allow CPU access. Um, you know, tons of stuff that I can do just to static meshes. I can change their, uh, you know, metadata. There's ways to load and save levels. There's tons of stuff here. So I really encourage you to, to dig in and, and uh, you know, that's how I figured out how a lot of this stuff works or what I can do is just by looking at the lists and being like, hmm. and then months later when I need to do something, I, I swear I saw that in one of those lists that I read. So anyway, gonna get back here and set the LOD on this sucker. So this is a little weird. Um, when you set the LODs, what it wants, so what it's asking for here is the reduction option. And so reduction options are, are uh, it's what's called a struct. And I can tell that because it's that dark blue. Um, and so what we're going to do is this weird chain of makes. And oftentimes, this is kind of how you'll set some stuff up in blueprints. Um, and so try and follow along here. I'm going to go from right to left. So what I want to do is make one of these options. So what this does is it creates, so you can see, uh, this options is a struct that contains a Boolean and an array. Well, now I need an array of reduction settings. So I can drag out and I can make, and I can make an array. 
So now I'm making an array and these tie into the LODs and I won't get into the weeds of LODs too much, but let you know that LOD zero is the high resolution, the one for when it's up close and then one, two, three, four, five, as long as you want. There's usually three to four LODs in most games. Some games have a lot more, it just depends. And so LOD zero, you wanna tell it, so it's asking for what goes in here. And so a lot of times when I'm like, I don't know what's going in here, you'll see what I'm doing is I'm dragging a wire out from that pin. And when I do, you can see it filters the list of possible actions that I can do to just the things that I can do to an editor scripting mesh reduction setting structure. Ooh, that rolls off the tongue. Well, I can make an editor scripting mesh reduction setting. Boom. And if you're used to LODs, uh, this is pretty common stuff. So what percentage of triangles do we want and at what screen size do we want to transition? So LOD zero, I don't want to reduce. I could, if I wanted to, if I had all my meshes were too high, I could be like, oh, let's crunch them down. So I'm going to set that at one. So 100% triangles uh, and a change at screen size one. So what I'm going to do now is if I click add pin, I get new LODs. So I'll make three LODs. So all I have to do is copy this over. So for LOD one, I want half as many triangles. And we'll say we'll transition it. And we'll just keep going. And so half of that is 0.25. Not the same, 0.25. And we'll make our last one, which is half of 0.25. And I don't like doing math, so check this out. 0.25 divided by 2. Neat trick. 0.25. There we go. So we've got our, our settings here. I'm going to compile, go ahead and save. And let's see if this works. Let's go ahead and find ourselves a nice mesh here. Let's add some LOD to it. Uh, how about the bench? We'll find it in the browser. I'll right click, scripted actions, set LODs. And just like that, it's done. And I can make sure that it is by going to LOD coloration, turning on mesh LODs. And sure enough, there is our bench LODing away. So that's cool. So I could go to each one and right click on it and change it. Oh no, even better. And just take all my static meshes. Oh, maybe I'll just do the, uh, the bricky one here. So wait, forever and ever. And I can run that scripted action on all of them at once. I'm gonna go sip my coffee. And then I get to go home. Tell my boss, it's taking hours to set the LODs, boss. Hours. I'm going to need another day. Um, let's go and check the uh, heat coloration. And sure enough, our stuff is transitioning. Now, it's not transitioning fast enough for me. This is a mobile game, and I want this stuff to transition soon. Like, I don't want to have to come all the way back here for that transition to happen. I want it. I want it to be more aggressive. So let me show you something cool too, is when you do this, if you want to edit your, your script, what's really cool is when you're on here, you can, and it says, you can shift click and it'll pop open the editor. So you can really come back and change how it works. Really nice. So what I want to do is um, there's this auto compute LOD screen size. So Unreal tries to figure out when the best time to switch LODs are. And it works pretty well for kind of higher poly LOD meshes. But when you have low poly like this, or you're going to mobile, you sometimes need to give it a little extra push. And so what I'd like the ability to do is when my artists or when I right click on these, I want to be able to choose whether or not I'm going to compute the LOD size or not. So the way I can do that is by adding an input our function. And when I do that, you'll see what happens. And so here's another great trick. Typically, if I wanted to add an input to a function, I'd come over here and add a parameter and give it a name and whatnot. Uh, but the easiest way to do that is to take whatever variable you want to set and just drag it over to the Terminator node. And boom, it automatically adds one and names it and sets everything for you. Um, so uh, yeah, that was easy. 
And so now if I compile and I'm going to set the default value to checked, because I want it to default. Now, when I run this, this content browser again, and I say scripted actions, set LODs, I get a little interface. So now it will ask me whether or not I'm doing that. So I can build really basic interfaces this way if I want to. Um, so you can see now I'm starting to make much more useful tools. And I can start to add in more and more stuff. And all of my tools have started that way. They all started with like a button. And then I gave them to the artist. And they're like, ooh, can it do this? Can it do that? What about this? And I, I write it all down. And then I go back and I add it all. And I get version 1.1. 1 .1, and it's got 10 times as many buttons on it. All of the tools in it. <laughs> they all started as like two buttons and ended up as this like really long panel. Because you know the artists are all like, oh, it'd be nice if it could do this and this and you know it's so much easier for me to just go in and add that and now they have this tool that's customized for exactly what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis well, let's actually do kind of what i did before grab all this we'll just run this again here and we'll turn this off hit okay and now you'll see right away that those meshes are LODing much faster uh, so just like that, I've done a ton of work, and um, I've really improved the number of, of polygons rendering. I did a little test before this and ran it on all the meshes, and it dropped me from 2.7 million triangles in this view to 800,000 triangles, which is, you know, for a right mouse click, is a pretty big win um, with basically no drop in quality whatsoever. So, um, you know, these sorts of tools are just so handy to have. Um, and, and you can see how easy that was to build. I, I just I did my first example, and it's just a couple of nodes. And of course, we can make them more complex, uh, and we can really you know add all sorts of logic and functionality to figure out you know if the object is so big, it uses this sets of settings. But it's great because it's now like hard coded in, and now every time you run that on your project, it's exactly the same, and all your meshes work same settings and no one had to stay the extra day on the weekend to go set all the LODs before you ship. Um, the tools are great. So that's uh, that's the kind of that's editor utility uh, uh, things. Um, I want to show you one more thing because as it works when you right click right now, um, if I right click on pretty much anything, this is a particle system. It'll still see if I can set LODs on it. And what if I wanted it to be a little fancier? And I wanted it, I had a ton of these. I've you know been working on this project for a year. And I want to make it so when I right click on a particle system, it only shows me the things that I can do to particles. I right click on a mesh, just the things I can do to a mesh. Well, what's really cool is this is that's actually built in already. So the way we get to that is through a thing that's very, again, very common for programmers, but for non-programmers, you might not have ever heard of this, it's called overriding a function. So there's already a function built in that figures out what class you're clicking on um, and whether or not you can right click on it. And we can override or we can decide we want to do something different with that function. So you can see the functions here says there's three overridable. When I mouse over, I can override. And this first one is the get supported class. And so you can see it returns the class this action act, this asset action supports. If not, it will show up for all asset types. So in this case, I don't want this to show up for textures or particle system. So I'm going to get supported class. And this is the function. So when I right click, this function will run and it will ask what classes are supported. And it will send it in here. And I'm guessing right now, it's set to like object, pretty much anything. So what we want to do, we're going to just get rid of this. And we want to say, well, what kind of class do we want? We want static mesh. And now if we compile, we right click on our particle system, it doesn't show up. But we right click on a static mesh, and there we go. So they're very simple, but we use these in production. We use these at Epic to 
build our games. So we've gone through the process of using them and been like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we could, wouldn't it be nice if you could shift click and pop the thing open? Wouldn't it be nice if we could expose a variable so you got a little quick interface that you didn't have to make? All of these things come from us using these tools uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we make these iterative improvements uh, to them so that they just get a little better and a little better until they're at this point where I'm like, this is a world-class tool. I'd be happy to deploy the uh, tools in this. So are there any questions uh, about uh, these types of blueprints or kind of anything that I've done here before I move on to kind of the next step of the next evolution of these utilities? There was one question there. Can you share these between projects? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, the easiest thing to do uh, or yeah, I guess one of the easy things to do oops, is you can always right click and you can migrate between assets or between set actions. You can migrate it uh, to another project that way. Mm -hmm. um, in that project, I do think you have to run them one time so that they register, but I'm not entirely sure. I'm pretty sure you do have to run them that one time and then they register with the project. Uh, so yeah, they are pretty shareable. Um, you could, if you're, you know, in a studio that has a custom engine built, you can build these into the engine and then they're available to everyone on every project. But that's only if you're in that specific situation. Otherwise, they migrate just fine. So uh, any others or shall we can use 3D viewports in Blueprint Utility Widgets? Ah. Uh. Ah, uh, not easily. <laughs> I think someone did a, a render target into one and then did like a camera control and it was it was pretty hokey. Um, not that I know of right now. There's another question about other functionality from the static mesh editor, and I would presume anything that's scriptable within Blueprint pretty, pretty much has access. Yeah, I think um, a lot of the build settings you can't change, but uh, LOD settings, uh, collision, um, materials, uh, UV mapping, mm -hmm. uh, there is a ton of stuff you can do. But it, it's a really good point that you should take a look at what's available uh, because you can't do absolutely everything. There are just some things that only happen on import or kick off some you know weird process where we couldn't uh, tie that in. So. Uh, really do have a look. Um, if you open up any blueprint uh, and go to the palette, you'll see there's a whole section called editor scripting when you enable that plugin. And then you can just kind of see all the functions that you could do uh, to modify assets and actors. All right. Are UMAPs assets? Yes, they are. Because they are in the content browser. Uh, therefore, they are an asset. Can you make a function run continuously? Yes. It's, you can totally dangerously have a function call itself, uh, like with a timer or something. Um, it, it is fairly dangerous because then you've got, you know, something like spawning something in your editor forever. So do use care. But yeah, I tried that myself. <laughs> I was like, can I just like spawn a bunch of stuff constantly? Yes. Uh, so careful. Timers do work, at least at least last time I did it. All right. So um, so cool. We've looked at like so we can do stuff to stuff in our content browser. And you can imagine you can rename stuff. So you could write a script that goes in and looks at if it's a material, does it have an M underscore before it? If not, put one there. You know, when we create material instances, it puts underscore inst at the end. I wrote a script that went and found anything that artists left that way, got rid of the inst and put an MI in front of it to fit with our naming convention. Uh, you know, and I just right clicked on the whole folder, let it run, and went, got some coffee, came back, and was like, and all our naming conventions are fixed. Sweet. Um, so yeah, there's, there's you know, endless. If there's pretty much anything that you do that's clicky in the editor and you're like, I wish I didn't have to do this so many times. Um, I don't know what that number is for everybody. Mine's about three. That's when I'm like, it's scripted time. 
maybe two, sometimes one. Um, so yeah, let's let's shift a little bit and let's look one. What if we want to do stuff to our actors in the level? We want to modify our level in some way and do stuff in the level. And two, what if we want to make it look a little nicer? What if this is something that my team does every freaking day and they're sick of right clicking and they've asked me, can I just get a button right here that I can just click on? Yes, yes, they can. We did something really cool. So we have what's called UNG, which is Unreal Motion Graphics. And we designed it to make user interfaces for video games because video games need user interfaces. So we made it. And it's, it's a really powerful user interface tool. Uh, it's hardware accelerated. It's multi-platform. So you, you make one UMG and it works on mobile to high-end consoles, you know, runs on a PS5 to a Switch. Um, all with the exact same code. So very much in line with how Unreal Engine can re -engine. Um, However, the editor is not built in UMG. The editor was built in the days before UMG with a system called Slate. And so up till now, if you wanted to create a panel or create a button in the editor, it was not great fun because you had to master this Slate system, which is written in a version of C uh, that is specifically for Slate. So it's like, it's its own programming language. So you can imagine that the number of people that know how to do that at a professional level is pretty slim. Um, and no one really wants to tackle that because the only time it's ever really used is for the editor. So editor tool people are totally into it. Everyone else doesn't want to do it. Um, and so, our tools folks went, well, what if? Could we make it so that you can make a UMG thing as an editor panel? And initially the answer was no way, they're totally incompatible. But then magic happened and one day Lauren came down from the heavens, dropped upon us the editor blueprint utility widget. And now we can create interface stuff using UMG for the editor, which is super powerful. And now that's been extended so that even plugin makers and panel makers can now not have to use the, uh, the, the canvas um, and can just use UMG, which is a little easier. It has like a user interface. There's nothing quite as fun as building a user interface in text. It's a special level of help. So, um, so yeah, so now we can take these user interface stuff and all the buttons and widgets and all that cool stuff that we made for making games, and we can make interfaces in the editor. So uh, when I created my last Blueprint class, uh, when I went to Editor Utilities, there was the Editor Utility. And it's got the little UMG icon. So I'll make one of these, and we'll call this GPU. Let's call this randomizer. So what I want from uh, this tool is over yonder, and I'm going to switch back to here. Over yonder in my scene, I've got all these rect columns that I've placed in the scene. Um, but they are all exactly the same size, and they are all facing exactly the same way. And of course, you know, I could go in and rotate and scale and, and do that. Not that hard. Let's say our game is Columns the Game. There's a million of these suckers. Or even just, there's a lot of stuff in games where I'll drag it out of the content browser, and then I want to kind of add some randomness and some rotation to. And up until now, it's pretty much been my workflow as I, uh, you know, I drag it out from the browser, that it's scaled to what I want it to be, and it's like seven. And then I drag it where I want it, and I get a little rotation, and I get a little scale, and I'll drag that to the next one, and I kind of do the same thing. And it's it works. It's not bad. I've done worse things in my life, but it's it's pretty tedious. And if the stuff's already set up, it gets it gets really tedious. So it would be great if I could just select all these and have them get randomized. So let's build that real quick. Um, go back to our editor here. Yeah. Let's open this up. So now this is a slightly different editor. So this is our regular editor, and this is the 
widget editor. So this is the UMG editor. This is a screen. It's supposed to look like a game screen in 16 by 9. And over here, we have a palette of, of cool stuff that we can do, like buttons and texts and sliders and all those things that you use to make HUDs. And we can drop those in here. So we're going simple. I need a button. We're just going button to start with. I'm going to drag a button up here. I'm going to style it a bit. I'm going to make it about five by five. I'm going to size to content, and that content's going to be text label. And we'll call this, this one's going to say randomize y'all. So we're going to randomize the y'all of all these guys. And I'm going to name this button so that it's not called button 209 because I'll have a hard time finding this. Let's call it button rando y'all. So when we click this button, we're going to make stuff happen. To do that, we now move over to the graph. So this is the way UMG works. Is we have this designer where we can lay out these widgets, uh, these elements, and then a graph, which is an event graph. So it's, it's almost like two editors kind of mashed together. We've got the layout editor, and then you click over here to do your logic. So you can see over here, we when I uh, gave that button a name, it turned it into a variable that shows up here. And when I click here, I have events and this is on clicked. So if you're used to making UIs or this sort of stuff, these you're like, oh, on clicked events, mouse over, I understand all that. Um, if not, as you work with UIs and stuff, you'll start to understand these sorts of things. So this is an event. Um, so when the user clicks on the button, um, and in this case, they have to click on the button and then release on the button for this event to fire. That's what on click is, is they've completed the full clicking action. So when they do that, this is going to fire and you can do stuff. So uh, when we click this button, what we're going to want to do is instead of get all selected assets, we're going to want all selected actors. Get all actors. Get. Did I not type it in? Oh, uh, get. There we go. And be forewarned, there are two. One of them is the VR scouting thing, and it doesn't work here. So if you're trying this, like I was yesterday, and I'm like, why won't it work? I was using this get selected actors not this get selected actors, obviously. So with the correct get selected actors now, but just like before, we get an array of them. So I'm going to do a for each. Now for each of these, I'm going to want to rotate them. So for each, for each element, as we loop through, we're going to, let's do add, No. Oh, that's an object reference. Aha, I did it again. So uh, I'm trying to find rotation. And objects don't have rotation. Objects are a class that doesn't exist in 3D space. Actors are the class that exists in 3D space. So I can't rotate an object because it doesn't have that variable. But I can rotate an actor. So like I did before, I'm going to have to cast and say, I want, I want an actor class. I want to be able to rotate this. So as an actor, something that exists in the scene, I can now add rotation to it. Add actor look. And how much do we want to rotate? Well, we're just going to rotate in the Z. So I'm going to split the struct pin so that I can get access to the Z. And I'm going to rotate it a random amount. So it's going to be random float in range 0 to 360 just like that. So there's there's my script. Uh, when I click on the button, I'm going to see all the selected. Oh, I got the wrong one. Look at that. They're so easy to mix up. That's assets. That's going to give me the wrong stuff. Because <laughs> assets don't live in the level. Assets are in the content browser. Selected actors. Get selected level actors. There's 
so many of them set. Ah, I want to get. That's more like it. And now I don't need this. I was wondering why I needed that because these are actors. As you can see here, it says array of actor object references. Um, so I can just get rid of this casting because this now will return. Oh, no, it won't. Here we go. <laughs> For each. I thought this was wrong. So now when I do that, it creates a different uh, for each loop that now returns actors instead of objects. And if you're new to blueprints and programming, I'm sure some of this is like, what the casting and variables and classes? Don't worry about it. Uh, it'll come <laughs> uh, as you use it and you kind of start to see some of these patterns. Some of that stuff will come. Uh, so now when I compile this, uh, yeah, so when I click this button, I should get the selected level actors, actors, not assets. And for each of them, I will add actor rotation. I'll rotate around. So let's see if this actually works here. And we'll go back to our level. And just like this one, we actually have to run it for the first time. And when we run it, look at that. There's our button. So you can see this is even dockable. So I can go and, you know, put my tool wherever. Now I've got a tool that sits in my interface and I can keep adding stuff in here. So that's super cool. So let's see if this works. I'm gonna, I might as well go select a few more of these. One hiding in the rubble. And let's randomize the yaw. Ta-da! Look at that, they've all been randomized. And I can just keep clicking and now I've got that randomization. Pretty cool, right? Pretty sweet stuff. Um, so when I did this, I was like, that's sweet. But I didn't do it right. And I went to undo. And look what happens. It doesn't have an undo. So by default, we actually have to program in the undo. And I'm going to just show this because I want people to know that, one, you can add undos. Two, it's fairly simple, but it's a little obtuse where you're like why that's so odd so i'm going to show it to you just so that you know that it's there and if you google search blueprint utilities undos this comes up um, so it, it's pretty straightforward so yeah i want to be able to undo that but what we have to do is it took me a while because if i just come in here and i type in undo um undie no not undies undo Undo, 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 there we go. I get this. And I was like, oh, that's the thing. Uh, what object? Uh, I tried to use it. It didn't work at all. So I had to Google it. And it turns out that it's called something else. Um, it is called, what is it called? A transaction? It's called a transaction. So that what we're calling it is, unfortunately, transactions. Uh, so if you come down here, I don't know, PQRS, P, transactions. So this is the undo system here. So uh, you kind of have to like begin and say, I'm starting a thing and it'll need to get undoed. And then you tell it, here's all the stuff I've done and now I'm done. And that tells Unreal, this is all the stuff that is in that undo. This is what undo means is undo all this. So what we have to tell it is we're beginning a thing and we have to give it a name because we can have multiple undos. So in this case, we're going to call this rando yaw. And there's a description that'll show up if you mouse over it. We'll go rando yaw. Why not? And then the primary object, who's going to store this undoness? It could be the level. It could be whatever. We're just going to say, why not have this script store all this information? So. We'll say get a reference to myself. So like I said, it's fairly easy to do, but it's pretty obtuse. Um, and I'm not expecting everyone to be like, I don't know how to do it. Just that they're going to Google search and be like, I saw Tom do an undo. So we begin the transaction. And then every time we do something, we kind of have to register it and tell the undo system. This is the undo stuff. Um, and that is done through. Do transact object. 
programmer language. So we're just telling Unreal who's who's getting changed. And this seems a little overly complex, but once you actually get into tools, it's really nice to be able to determine what gets undoed and what doesn't and what the undoes are called, et cetera. Um, so out of the box, I'm like, oh, why doesn't it just undo? But as someone who's built a lot of these tools, I'm actually rather happy that it doesn't just assume. Um, it can also be fairly dangerous for memory as well. So then once we're done with the whole undo context, we have to finish it by saying end transaction, and we're good. Um, so now if I compile, I come back to my level, and uh, let me just go sales and set the station all to zero. Now we will randomize their yaw. Now when I go to edit undo, it says undo rando yaw. So I even got to name it a stupid name, and it actually works. Uh, so yeah, again, these are really robust tools, and we use them, so we've really thought through a lot of this kind of functionality. Um, and we can just we can take this this further. And what's really cool is if I close this project and open it back up, it stays here. So you only have to run it that one time to register it with the windowing system, and then it always runs. And there's even a, an option in here if you want to provide this to your team and you don't want them all to have to go to run to get it. Uh, there's actually an option in your class defaults right here. You can always register with Windows. So uh, you can click on that, give it to your team, and uh, it will end up, because it ends up actually just like our other thing. Now under Window, we have Editor Utility Widgets, and we can toggle our Utility Widget there. So uh, you know, we really treat your tools like a first-class citizen in the editor. So they they show up and they can be really useful. We want to we we want to make sure it's not clunky or you don't have to build a tool to fix our tools. Um, so yeah, we can we could keep going. Uh, where's my? There's some really really good. We've actually added in some additional functionality. So um, I will wrap this with a vertical box, and then I will grab myself another button here. Oops, I did that wrong. Wrap this one with a vertical box. Give me both, please. And now, of course, if I compile, let's see, I come back and I have both buttons. So you can see once it's registered, it's live and you can keep uh, working on it. So in this case, I want to add a, another button. Let's that one. Let's call this like randomize scale. Uh, but I want some options here. So I'm going to wrap this one in a horizontal box. I just want you to see like how cool UMG is and how quick you can just like start adding the stuff in. Uh, and let's see, what I want is I want uh, some text that says, oops, the horizontal box and vertical box are cool. They just automatically stack things horizontally and vertically. So using them in combos, you can build interfaces super quick. So this text box, let's have that say min. And let's put an input spin box next to it. So the next thing in the horizontal box is the spin box. That looks good. And the minimum is one. And we need both of these again. Oop, couple, and this one's say predictably max. So just do a little styling. And we'll do that. And say that. Uh, and like that. So, not the prettiest. I can make it look better. Uh, now, when I compile and come back, though, here we go. And you know, these are cool slidery things. Again, you can go and set it so it's all nice and even and doesn't scale and stuff. But no, I'm doing stuff quick right now. So cool. So what I'm going to do is with this button here called Rando Yaw 2, I'm going to rename it, call it Button Rando Scale. Same thing. Now if I go to the graph and click on Rando Scale, add a on-clicked, 
Uh, I'm going to do this. I'm just going to take what I've already done here. Copy, paste. Okay. Rando scale. Those don't have to be the same. I'm just doing that uh, to make things easier on myself. So now for each one of these uh, meshes, I'm going to set scale. And what I want is, oh, these are called spin box and spin box 60. I don't know what that means. Let's, let me be good. Let me name these. So spin box, this is spin box min. And this is max. That's a lot easier to see which ones are which. All right. So what I want in here is spin box max. I want to get the value. Same thing for spin box min. This will give me the value of what's in that slider box in max. We'll do a random float in range, minimum, maximum. And then we'll just hook that right in there. And what's really cool is I'm just making a float or a single variable, just an X. Uh, and if I pump that into the relative scale, which is an X, Y, Z, or a vector, Unreal automatically will convert that and it'll put X, Y, Z uh, together in the same. So it'll all be, all three will be the same. Now I can compile. Ah, got my transactioning. Of course, I want the undo. There go. And then we are going to end the transaction. Boom. And compile. And come back here. And now, randomize scale. Holy moly. <laughs> well, that's not right. Because these are already seven, so let's do it like six and eight. And you can see tabbing even works. So I just tabbed between those, and it works. And there we go. And now, of course, I can un. So you can see that you can build really nice interfaces, dynamic interfaces. You can, there's lists, so you could list all your selected objects and change their parameters there. The sky's really the limit. Like, you know, as flexible as UMG is for making games, um, and if you think about all of the interfaces in Fortnite, you could do anything like that as a panel in your editor. So I've even seen people that have like a set of blueprints or, or classes that they just use all the time, and they go and make a panel where then they just click on it and plops one into their scene. So it's not doing a whole lot, but they don't have to dig through their content browser all the time. And they're like, I never remember the favorite. So I just made this panel and I put my classes in there. I click them, it spawns one in my scene. I'm like, oh, why not? Uh, you know, there's all sorts of things that you can do. And then all the way to like the super complex where um, I've built systems that go and put down crosswalk stripes and in between certain things, it's all kind of procedural and dynamic. It's, it's really sky's the limit. So that's, uh, that's kind of what I've got. And, and it's, it's important to note too that everything that I did here, other than the UMG stuff, can be done with Python. Um, so if you're building pipelines and you're trying to solve for this stuff, this is all of this stuff is exposed to Python, um, but you can't build interfaces with Python. So at that point, you're using it. So oh, cool. Any any questions from the crowd? I wish the place actors tab is as customizable as this, right? Uh, well, now you can make your own place actors. There's even uh, drag and drop capabilities uh, that are built into UMG as well, so you can make stuff uh, that does stuff similar to this. I do wish I do wish that we could like I could go and modify uh, the existing panels, but I think I'd probably do more damage than good. <laughs> I 
that was pretty awesome. Good job, Tom. A lot of Thank people you. in the chat were like, whoa. That's pretty, I mean, that's, that's, I watch people do blueprints all the time and I'm like, whoa, I didn't know you could do that. Yeah. And so the, the VOD will be up, you know, usually it comes up after the Twitch stream is over, you know, within the half hour to maybe an hour tops. So any of you yep. who missed and were trying to follow along, you'll be able oh, to yeah. follow along. Or, or those that after. have watched and wanted to pause and rewind. That is the true power of the YouTube. I have spent many hours pausing and rewinding and then shorts and Chris Murray's videos. Murphy's videos. <laughs> How? And then it'll go up on YouTube in the next uh, day or two on the Unreal yep. Engine channel. I also want to let everyone know that that example that I did with the LODs is actually on our documentation site. Um, I didn't know that. I went and built the system myself, and then I was searching for help, and I was like, oh, look, it's in the documentation. Um, so uh, if you follow the documentation on in editor scripting, let's see, docs. Dun, dun. There is actually a tutorial that's not the most obvious. So this is the scripting and automating the editor. If you Google search that, I'll take you here. And if you look over here on the left, there's editor scripting how to's. And this is also really cool. So you've got, we've got two, we've got creating LOD and blueprints in Python. And if we come in here, it tells you all about LODs and stuff. But what's really cool is we show you how to do this in blueprints, but there's a button here and you can see how to do it in Python as well. So it's a one-to-one -one between blueprint and Python um, for, for, uh, for this. Uh, which I think is super cool. I love being able to see exactly how one works or the other. So you can see in here, pretty much you, you import Unreal, um, and then you use the same function names, editor asset library, load assets, get LOD counts, et cetera. So very much the same thing that you're doing in Blueprint, just in a text format. And again, this could run outside of the engine, load up the engine stuff. So. You know, each one has its benefits. You can use UMG with one. You can run it out of the editor with the other. So the combo is the best way through. Does LOD work the same way for foliage instant meshes? Yes. Foliage fully uses LOD, and you should be using LOD in your foliage. Mm -hmm. uh, foliage does do a, a dithered transition by default. Um, which can sometimes look a little funny if you move really quickly. Um, but there's some ways around that. Uh, but yeah, totally be using... Yeah, LODs are really important for anything that gets repeated a lot. Um, so your wins on LODs, if you've got that one big mountain in the background and there's only one of them, your LOD wins are going to be okay. But if you've got a thousand columns and you can shave 500 triangles off each one whoa now you got 50,000 triangles out of your scene that's a big win without any you know obvious visual quality drop so um yeah stuff like foliage and that's something that when i'm looking at a scene i i look for those things that are repeated a lot or that are in my scene a lot using a lot of uh a lot of uh Triangles. I want to tell people though, uh, if you don't know, because I always forget this is here. You go to window, you can go to statistics. There's this whole statistics thing in here that I oh, always forget about. And it's a spreadsheet that tells you about your levels. And you've got primitive stats, texture stats, baking info. But in primitive stats here, you can very easily see, for example, um, which actor is using the most triangles in your scene? And in our case, it's landscape. And then we've got this large rock. There's 137 of them. Um, and each one has 2,000 triangles. Therefore, I have 327 triangles. So I could, if I had to like, oh, there's this one thing. And I've very often opened a scene and been like, oh, that one glass that they're using on every table 
has 50,000 triangles and there's 50,000 of them. No wonder the scene is bogging. I can fix that one and we're good to go. So the statistics thing is great. Um, mm -hmm. Texture stats is really useful uh, just to make sure like you don't have any crazy big textures. Um, you know, I've, I've found like HDRIs that are sitting in things eating up tons of memory that aren't being used like a variable. Uh, statistics, this window, I, I always forget it's there until I'm like, wish I could tell how many, oh, yeah, I can't, it's there. So a couple more questions popped into the chat there, Tom. Yeah, let's see. Can you use UMG to customize your own inspector for a specific actor type? Totally. Uh, so yeah, you could... Uh, you can, there's some events that you can tie into that'll make it update every time you click on a different actor. Um, so you could totally have like a custom details panel here or a panel that has a bunch of information about your actor and, you know, specific buttons to change it or whatever it shows its metadata or, or whatever you want. Um, I built like a simple light lister um, in, in here because I wanted to be able to just see all my lights in the scene and turn them on and off really quickly without having to go up to the world that liner and type in light, misspell it as kite, uh, and, and then click on it and then, you know, go to the details just like, oh, I can just put them all here and I can find all my lights and turn them on and off really. And yes, animations and widget utility blueprints. You can, you can put materials on these. Uh, you know, it's, it's running full on UMG. So you have spinning, wobbling, shining buttons to distract your designers with. <laughs> uh, curve input. Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't, there is not a curve editor widget that ships, uh, but you could pump curve data into it. So we're uh, running to uh, into the second hour, or, you know, two hours into the stream. So we're going to start wrapping this up. If there's a uh, one question, maybe more, two questions. One thing I wanted to add is that, uh, you know, what Tom did here it was, you know, really impressive, and I think a, a great example of how to use Blueprint widgets uh, to make working inside of a, a level a little bit easier, but I don't think that uh, it was terribly intimidating, right? So if you you know, are teaching art and design or filmmaking or something like that, uh, I think this is a great example of exploring these tool sets and you know, mm -hmm. realizing, and, and some of the other things that we've seen is people in film studios using uh, Blueprint widgets to make uh, their own custom burn-ins and custom camera mm -hmm. tools, all kinds of different camera tools, people in a variety of different shops, not just game development shops, using it to, mm -hmm. to really help make tools, you know, for their teams of people that maybe aren't quite as active in Unreal Engine or uh, whatever the case might be, make their lives just a little simpler and easier to get around inside of, you know, the engine, specifically now that you can dock these tools and make it easier mm -hmm. to customize unreal as a whole so uh, if you've got more dedicated programmers or people that maybe come into a program with a little bit of you know scripting or programming chops uh, this really helps liberate an entire team in many ways mm -hmm. yeah and it it's it's i think it's just key to, to helping students understand that that tech art is a, a career and and just helping them along that that line, because the question came up earlier, it comes up a lot, is how do we teach tech art? Do we start a tech art track? Do we have a tech art class? Maybe. I think everyone should be exposed to tech art, but it, it really is about having those avenues available so that when those students kind of identify themselves, they can have something to do on, on their student teams that really util utilizes the, that skill set. Um, and you'll see that the team ends up like just relying on them and they instantly become a really valuable asset to whoever they work with. I want to remind you all also that uh, next week we have a great stream next Friday. Uh, we've got um, 
some really amazing programmers from Epic that will be joining to talk about uh, programming in C++ inside of Unreal Engine. So those of you who uh, come from a programming background, maybe are teaching programming, uh, and really want to understand the distinction between gameplay program and programming and engine programming. Uh, we're going to spend the the whole stream talking, you know, two gameplay programmers to engine programmers at Epic to talk about, you know, the work that they do. Uh, you know, maybe there are some folks that don't know exactly the difference. Maybe you you know the mm -hmm. difference, but don't know the day to day work. Uh, and so we're bringing in some some experienced uh, developers, some guys that have been at Epic programming for over 10 years, and uh, some yeah. guys that have some amazing uh, titles like principal mathematician, and some guys that, <laughs> that, you know, are systems programmers on, you know, our current games to come in and talk about how they do their work. And so um, that's next yeah, Friday that's at 2 p.m. So cool. Eastern time. And, uh, and that should be a really awesome stream because we've had, I think, a lot of streams focused on C++, but I don't recall off the top of my head that we've had a stream where we brought in both engine programmers and gameplay programmers and said, you know, what do you do every day? What do you do every day? Mm -hmm. and, and if you are teaching programming in an academic institution, you know, what should you focus on? You know, what is the distinction? Yeah. Uh, so that'll be really exciting. Yeah, and, I, you know, the the... The, the group that's coming has such uh, varied backgrounds and responsibility is what they're doing. I think it'll be really eye-opening for for folks to to understand the breadth of of programming as well. I think you know, even I when I started out, I thought in very kind of siloed terms: programmer, artist, whatever. Um, and you know the understanding the difference between gameplay programming and engine programming and graphics programming and all that is is really key to helping students figure out where they're they're going and so it's going to be really cool to talk to talk to them and uh hear their stories and really dig into what they do yeah so that's uh june 26th friday uh at 2 p.m again eastern time here so make sure you tune in. Thank you once again for participating with us this Friday. We had a great time. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Mark. And I uh, hope you all have a great weekend. Stay safe and uh, and join us again. I think we've been having a lot of fun with these. And uh, once again, keep an eye out for the recording. should be up in a little while. And come rewatch it again on Unreal Engine uh, YouTube channel and take a look at the playlist because this, I believe, is our sixth or seventh educator stream, and we've had a lot, uh, some really good ones in the past couple of weeks as well. So, thank you all. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week. See you next week, everyone. Thanks, everyone.